Okay. So in this lecture, I want to talk about thinking about determinants geometrically. What I said in the last lecture was that far more important than any formula for determinants, you should understand the properties that they have. And I told you three key properties. One of them was that if I switch two columns of my matrix, any two columns, but I have the last two in this example, and I make a new matrix with those two columns in the opposite order, my determinant picks up a minus sign. That was the first property. The second one is that if I rescale a column of my matrix, I wind up rescaling my determinant by that same scalar factor. And the third property was that if I, one, if I take one column of my matrix and write it as a sum of two vectors, y plus z, then I can write this determinant as a sum of two determinants. Each of these properties was true both for the rows and for the columns. Uh, today, we're mostly going to focus on the column versions. Okay, so I want to give you a geometric way of thinking about these three properties. So let V1, V2, dot, 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 VK be the columns of our matrix. And I'm going to use those columns to make a box, the technical word for it is a parallel piped in K dimensional space. So if K is two, what I'm talking about here is a parallelogram. So here's my parallelogram. I'll shade it in for you. Vector V1 is over here. Vector V2 is over here. And I use V1 and V2 as the sides of my parallelogram. In three dimensional space, here's my best attempt at a, project, at a perspective drawing. I take vector V1 and vector V2, and I use them to make a parallelogram. And then vector V3 points into the screen, and I use that to sweep out my parallelogram and make a three-dimensional figure. If you have trouble with this drawing, here's an attempt to see it in real life. Take a look at my camera for a moment. Here is a three-dimensional parallel pipette. So, Here's vector V1, vector V2, vector V3. V1 and V2 are the sides of this parallelogram. And then it's swept out through space along vector V3 to make this three-dimensional figure. So hopefully this will help you understand what sort of shape I'm talking about when I'm talking about a parallel pipette. Or since I would, or as I'm just going to say sometimes, a box. Okay. <clears throat> and the thing that I want to tell you is that the determinant, or more carefully, the absolute value of a determinant of A is the volume of this box. Now, we've got an absolute value here, so let's talk about sign for a moment. Determinants can be positive or negative. And what the sign of a determinant tells you is the orientation of the basis. So in two dimensions, the convention is that the determinant is positive if V2 is counterclockwise of V1. So in this picture, V2 is counterclockwise from V1, that's a positive determinant. In three dimensions, I want my image to go big again you have sort of a right-hand rule. You have vector V1, you have vector V2. And you say, oh, is V3 on this side of the plane with V1 and V2? Or I'll try to break my fingers for you, is it on the other side? So if it's on this side, you have positive, And if it's in the other direction, you have negative. Uh, I could probably illustrate that a little better. Thumb is V1, finger is V2. If V3 is on one side, it's positive. If V3 is on the other side, like this, it's negative. OK. I'm mostly not going to focus on signs today. I mostly want you to remember that the determinant is basically the volume, but there is a sign here, and that's the role for the sign. And in fact, I'm going to talk about that sign a little more right now. So the first property of determinants was that if I switch two of these columns, I switch the sign, but nothing else changes. And indeed, if I switch the names of vectors V1 and V2, I have the exact same box, 
this parallelogram and this parallelogram are the same guy, but here V2 is counterclockwise from V1, here V2 is clockwise from V1, so I have switched the sign. So the area of this is negative the area of this. I'll write that down. The area of this guy equals negative the area of this guy. Okay, so that's how to think about our first property of determinants, the property of it switching the columns, which is the sign. Our next property of determinants was that rescaling one column rescales the area or the volume. So indeed, if I were to take one of my vectors, in this example, I chose V1 and multiply it by some scalar C, I would rescale the area by that same C. The gray area is C times the big white area. And you can imagine that also in three dimensions, I'll make myself big so you can see my parallel pipette again. If I were to take my parallel pipette and chop it in half in this direction, so reduce this vector by a factor of one half, that would reduce my volume by a factor of one half. Okay, now let's look at the hardest property, the property that if I have one vector and I break it up as y plus z, then this big determinant here is the sum of these two determinants. So this is not a perspective picture. This is a two-dimensional picture. And in this two-dimensional picture, there's a vector v1, and there's a vector y, and there's a vector z. And over here, there's a vector y plus z. So the pink parallelogram here has area given by the determinant of the matrix, one of whose columns is v1, and the other one of whose columns is y plus z. So that's the pink guy. And over here, which I'd made the pink guy pink, but I'm not going to go back for that. But I'll do it for the others. Over here, the maze guy has columns V1 and Z. So that's the determinant of the matrix with V1 and with Z. And the blue guy again has base V1, but its other side is Y. So what I'm claiming to you is that when I take a determinant of this and add it to a determinant of this, I should get the determinant of this. So why should that be true? Why should it be, in other words, why should it be true that blue plus maze ah, Sorry, I'm just going to keep going though. Why should it be true that blue plus maze should equal pink? Why is that? So we want to look at these three parallelograms here and see why the pink guy, why should its area be the sum of this area and this area? Well, these are three parallelograms that all have the same base. And the area of a parallelogram is base times height. So indeed, if I look at the height of the blue guy, 
and add on the height of the maze guy, because the way vector addition works, I'm going to get the height of the pink guy. So because this height is this height plus this height, we deduce that this area, the pink area, is this area, the blue area, plus this area, the maze area. I'm just gonna pause and give you all a chance to absorb that. You might wanna pause your video even longer, and then let's move on. Okay. Now, you might've been wondering a while back whether it was really a good idea to let determinants be negative. Maybe I should just make a determinant always be positive, so it'll be a volume. But may, letting determinants be negative means that this formula is still right when my vectors are oriented in different ways. So here I've made a new drawing where y and z are on opposite sides of v1. And you can see now, I'm gonna extend my base v1 a bit so you can see it longer. Whoops. Yeah, there's my extended base V1. You can see that in this case, here's my maze height, here's my blue height, here's my pink height. My pink height this time is maze minus blue, so the area of pink is the area of maize minus the area of blue, but blue is oriented in the opposite way from the others, right? Z is clockwise from V1, and so is Y plus Z, whereas Y is counterclockwise. So the determinant of V1 and Y is negative, whereas the determinants of V1 and Z and V1 and Y plus Z are positive. So that gives us the minus sign that we need, and it is still true that this determinant is this determinant plus this determinant, even though the relationship between areas is that this area, the pink area, is the maze area minus the blue area. So to sum up, all of these properties have straightforward geometric meanings. This first property says that switching two columns switches the sign of how my vectors are oriented. This second property says that rescaling a column rescales my area. And this third property is about how the volume or area of a parallel pipette changes when I add, when I change its height while keeping the base the same. Okay, when we pause here and then there's something more to say. Okay, now one way to think about this box is that it's the image under A of the unit cube. So this drawing is a little bit cluttered, but what I've done is I've labeled each of the eight vertices of my box as A of zero, 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 that's the zero, that's zero, A of one, zero, zero, that's V1, a of 0, 1, 0, that's V2. A of 1, 1, 0, that's V1 plus V2. And so forth, the eight corners of this box are the eight corners of the unit cube with, with the matrix A thrown in front of them. And the interior of this box is the image of the interior of the unit cube. Now, this is, so, and thus we see that the, area of A times the cube is the determinant of A, with absolute value, times the area of the cube. Okay, this is not just true for the, so our formula that says that this area on the left is the absolute value of determinant of A, I'm gonna think of that as absolute value of determinant of A times the area of the cube, the area of the unit cube being one. 
Now, this is not just true for the unit cube. In fact, for any shape at all, if I hit that shape with the matrix A, I will affect its volume by the determinant of A. So here's a figure from back in lecture 3A. Here's the bell tower. And here's the bell tower after I've applied a certain two by two matrix to it. <clears throat> I believe that was uh, one point five, zero point four, zero point five, zero point eight, if I remember correctly, and. And if you want to know what is the area of the clock over here, what will be the area of this clock times the determinant of this matrix? If you want to know what's the area of the whole front face of the bell tower, it will be the area of the front face of the bell tower here times the determinant of this matrix. Every single object here has its area multiplied by the same scalar factor which is this determinant. And if you want to understand why it's the same factor everywhere, just imagine covering our left-hand image with little regular squares. Then we apply our linear map and each of those little squares turns into a little parallelogram. And every one of those little parallelograms has area multiplied by, that, by the determinant. So if you want to know what the area of the front of the bell tower is, we'll just count how many little squares cover it. And then over here in the transformed image, count how many little parallelograms cover that. And you'll see that the ratio of the areas is the ratio of the area between an individual square and an individual parallelogram. And this lead, so that's why the volume of A times any shape X at all is the determinant of A, absolute value, times the volume of X. There's one more really important property of determinants, which I've saved till now, because I think the best way to think about it is geometrically. Let's compute the volume of A times B times X in two ways. One way, so here A and B are two n by n matrices. If we think about it as AB times X, then we see this should be the absolute value of determinant AB times the volume of X. On the other hand, if we think about it as A times B times X, then that should be determinant of A times the volume of BX, which should be determinant of A times determinant of B times volume of X. So we deduce that the determinant of AB, absolute value, is the product of a determinant of A and a determinant of B. And I gave you an argument here which has some absolute values in it, but in fact, the signs work out. So in fact, this is our last awesome property of determinants the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. Okay, I have now told you all my favorite properties of determinants. And the last thing to do is finally to tell you a formula for the, the determinant. That's what I'll do in the third lecture.